Good morning, everyone. We're very happy to welcome you to this uh, webinar on the European agricultural crisis. And we are also um, very happy to welcome four high quality experts. So there will be Panayotis Kalfunsos. He's our Greek speaker and he is the uh, head of the uh, farmers cooperative uh, in a Tessaly. It's called Teski. For the Nourir Collective, uh, we have uh, Mathieu Courgeot with us, uh, who is its uh, vice president. Aurélie Catalo, head of uh, French agriculture at IDRI, and Gizine Langlotz, uh, spokesperson of uh, ABL Farming, the German Farming Trade Union. You will be able to introduce yourself with more details when it will, when it's your time to take the floor. Let me just explain how things uh, will work from a technical point of view. Each speaker will speak in their mother tongue. So if you want to listen to the language uh, that you want as a participant, you have a button at the bottom of your screen. It's called interpretation. You click on it, you can choose to listen to the original audio without any interpretation if you speak the language. Or you can choose German, French, English, Greek. And you can go back and forth between languages if it's useful for you. Finally, if you want to ask questions, uh, we have a Q&A a box at the bottom of your screen so you can ask your questions and we'll take 15 minutes at the end for a Q&A session. I hope that it's clear for everyone and we will get started now. The goal of the webinar, the goal of the webinar is to analyze the causes of this major agricultural crisis in Europe, in several European countries and uh, we'd like to see what uh, the potential solutions are to uh, exit the crisis so that all farmers and consumers can live uh, in a decent way and uh, eat healthy food. So I have a first question about the causes of the crisis. And I would like each of you to explain what you think the main causes are, structural, conjunctural causes of the crisis in the past few years and also more recently, if you think there might have been uh, triggers in your respective countries and more generally speaking at our European level. Let's start with Panayotis uh, regarding the uh, Greek situation. So in Greek, uh, there was a natural disaster called Daniel, it occurred um, a while ago when it made the situation very challenging in terms of farmers yield so you'll explain to us what happened and give us some background each speaker will have five minutes for this question and also five minutes to answer my second question later and then we'll have a 15 minute q a session with the audience panayotis uh, you have the floor thank you Elspera. Good morning. My name is Panayotis Kalfuntos, and I am chairman of TES GI, the Cooperative Farmers of Tessaly. Thank you for today's invitation. I'm convinced that it is very important that we exchange uh, experiences and uh, also discuss these topics which are slightly different in our different countries. In Greece, we have an enormous problem with uh, high production costs. Our farmers are really suffering under these uh, costs. They are simply not sustainable for certain crops. The system has to change. One of our biggest demands in, as part of my cooperative, as part of uh, farmer associations is uh, the diesel prices, as well as um, um, diesel for agricultural vehicles. We would like to see subsidies for agricultural diesel. The Greece um, government, the government in Greece uh, gives us a certain reduction per hectare. At the moment, 
we have seen a tripling in uh, diesel prices uh, compared to the situation a few years ago. As I said, this is a big issue for farmers in Greece. It is a big issue because we have um, crops that need a certain amount of irrigation, a certain amount of uh, electricity. In addition to this, we are also facing a number of uh, different problems. For example, we also see prices rising, doubling, tripling compared to uh, last year um, when it comes to fertilizers and other different tools in agriculture. Simultaneously, we see that prices have also increased, especially last year, um, compared to the situation before the crisis, for example, um, when we look at corn. What does that mean? It means that our crops uh, um, generate less income, but the costs for production of corn continue to rise. For example, we have agricultural machinery that cost 60,000 euros a few years ago and now cost 150,000 euros. So put simply, I can say that we are facing this uh, increasing cost level in all different areas. And at the same time, um, the, the yields are less and less um, uh, productive. Of course, we also have to face uh, economic crises. We've also had to face the pandemic. So you can imagine that we are really struggling. Farmers in Greece are struggling. And this is also why they take to the streets. Production costs are simply too high. They continue to rise. And this is also um, connected to the lack of sustainability that we have in agriculture in Greece today. I don't think that this is a problem that Greece has to face on its own. It's something we see throughout the EU. Secondly, I would like to say a few words about farmers' rights in Greece, especially connected to the new common agricultural policy. In Greece, there were 10 different uh, measures, policy measures that the Greek government proposed. But I think that these measures are not sustainable. We know that especially small productions, small farms are really struggling to meet these new demands. We see that um, the transition towards a greener type of agriculture is uh, certainly laudable. But I think that these measures take time. You cannot simply um, bring them about from one day to the next. You really have to tackle the root of the problem. In addition to this, we have a very difficult uh, uh, situation with regards to geopolitics. We see that uh, the European policy has shifted recently. We see that uh, the measures uh, that we now want to implement are softened. Um, they are sort of pulled back in some areas, but still the Greek farmers are taking to the streets. And why are they doing so? We demand that all uh, new policy measures, uh, the red tape around fertilizer and and other EU regulations um, are pulled back. We need these regulations that are in favor of greener agriculture to be realistic. The EU needs to find clear answers for this. We farmers want to bring about a new era for the common agricultural policy. We want to see a new structure that takes into account a different number of parameters, for example, the ongoing war in the Ukraine or the pandemic. Thank you. Merci beaucoup, Panayotis, pour cette, uh, cette vision globale. Panayotis, de... thank you very much for this uh, uh, global uh, outlook of the Greek situation. I'm going to give the floor to Gesine Langlots from uh, ABL. You're the spokesperson of this uh, 
a German a trade union for farmers. So same question, what's the situation in Germany and uh, why is there so much protest from, coming from farmers in Germany? Hello also um, from my side. Thank you for the invitation and can any can everybody hear me? In Germany, we've seen the protests uh, beginning uh, before Christmas, uh, after what well, changes that were made to subsidies uh, in Germany. And what we've seen in then was that farmers throughout the country uh, started to protest against these uh, policy changes. I think that today the demands that farmers uh, put bring forward uh, are rather vague. Uh, slowly, uh, these uh, demands um, are more and more um, um, concrete. We also have a, a number of different associations, also uh, right-wing extremist uh, farmers associations who, uh, who come together, who take to the streets. We've seen that these protests uh, were very visible. There was a uh, one week where lots of farmers uh, protested in the German streets. And this was very surprising for a big part of the German um, society. My association, the ABL, the Association for Agriculture, has not been very active in this uh, farmers' protests. Many members of my association did protest, especially against uh, this um, takeover from right-wing extremists. But there was a lot of effort made uh, around communication. We especially tried to um, communicate clearly to uh, other uh, associations outside of Germany our concerns and our problems. We have to say that in, in Germany, there's a, a very, a very different um, analysis of the situation. There are parts of, there are certain German associations that would like to see um, um, liberation of uh, agricultural policy. And then there's the opposite. There is associations uh, pushing forward more protective uh, political measures. Um, in the beginning, the protests uh, were very, uh, very different, also from uh, from one federal state to the next. The organization was very different, um, although there was a so certain kind of uh, conservative hegemony. The problem that we see now is that there is a clear conflict between a, a more liberal approach to agriculture and a more protective approach. We know the changes that the European Union has uh, suggested with this new common agricultural policy. We are all aware of these changes, um, that, but, but those details, they are not really uh, taken into account. In Germany, the youth organization has um, yeah, tried to communicate around it, but that was it, basically. So we have to say that we are very curious to see where uh, this, uh, this uh, whole discussion will take us. We see that uh, um, farmers are now uh, criticized, especially those who want to safeguard biodiversity, who want to uh, push uh, forward organic farming. Um, these farmers are criticized and uh, being told that uh, their measures are too expensive, their demands are simply unrealistic. So we have that these few stakeholders uh, that want to push more progressive means who also want to take into account the protection of biodiversity, uh, climate change measures, organic farmers. So it will be exciting to see what these protests, uh, especially also in Eastern Germany, uh, will bring about because it is an election year, especially in the Eastern part of Germany. And we think that uh, these protests will play an important role. So this is just a, a brief overview to what's been going on. So thank you for telling us more about the French situation. It's very interesting to to hear all of the situations. And uh, now let's move on to the uh, next uh, country of France, where the Mathieu Courgeot, who's the head of the uh, 
collectif Nourrir. Mathieu, in five minutes, could you please uh, give us an overview of the situation in France so that we can better understand what's uh, happening there? I can hear some background noise, by the way. I don't know if uh, someone has uh, left their microphone on. I'm hearing something. I don't know if I'm the only one. So let's keep going. Mathieu, you have the floor. Thank you. Yes, I do hear the background noise, but it's OK, it's gone now. So I'm a farmer. I am a livestock breeder in France, and I'm the co-chair of the Collectif Nourrir, representing uh, 54 organizations, uh, farming organizations, as well as environmental organizations and uh, civil society organizations. So just a few words on our analysis. It's uh, very close to that of the colleagues who spoke just before me. Uh, we have to say that uh, mobilization was a uh, huge, quite unprecedented. It had been a while since uh, uh, there has been such uh, demonstrations from the farming world. It's not just one crisis. Uh, there are several crises and um, analyses and demands might be different. So from a political point of view, it's not easy to respond. And I think uh, there's a discomfort in the uh, uh, farming uh, uh, world and uh, it's spreading to the whole European um, I can hear the the translation at the same time so the main problem in France was mostly compensation income one farmer out of five in France lives under the poverty threshold so the, the figure is a uh, is uh, very significant and there are income inequalities that are growing in the agricultural uh, industry and uh, there are more and more poor farmers and uh, farmers that are getting richer and richer. So growing inequalities that are part of uh, the problem that we have today. Agricultural prices were uh, quite acceptable for a couple of years. Uh, now the, the prices are going down in terms of production. And for 15 years now, we've had quite unstable uh, agricultural prices. And for us farmers, it makes our daily job more and more complicated. It's hard for us to um, see what's going to happen in the future. Investments uh, are done on longer periods of time. Unstable prices are a real challenge for us. And as the Greek colleague said, um, production costs are on the rise, as even uh, in uh, quite uh, independent systems. You know, in my system, we do not buy pesticides or fertilizers. We do buy equipment. Um, so production costs are rising, but it's not necessarily related to uh, the increase in our product's cost. And uh, last but not least, it's quite specific to uh, the beginning of the crisis in France, south of France, uh, uh, because of uh, organic farming. And in the Occitanie region, it's 25, 20 percent of uh, organic farming. So that was the beginning of uh, the demonstration and challenges uh, related to um, organic farming. So income is the, the key point, uh, really, uh, for uh, farmers. But for now, we haven't received um, real responses from the French government. And the other thing is that there's more and more vulnerability to uh, many crises. Um, there was the uh, health uh, crisis, uh, the um, um, avian uh, flu crisis, and more recently, we there was the uh, uh, episodic uh, disease in the southwest uh, of uh, Fra France, um, climate problems as well, more droughts. All of that increases uh, the feeling of uh, vulnerability in farming. And finally, one last point, 
There's a lack of renewal of generations. Uh, there are fewer and fewer farmers, 200 farms disappearing every week. So who is going to take over? That's the main question. Most farmers uh, will retire in the next 10 years. Uh, who's going to take over? That's uh, an uncertainty. It's not necessarily part of the priorities, but it's uh, definitely a key issue for us. And just a word about standards. I think that we should definitely address it. When you say standards um, can be um, understood in many different ways, but it's mostly about how our income is based on uh, the common agricultural policy uh, aid, and um, and that's a problem for us. What about the price of our products then? What about um, what we do, our work? It's not worth a lot because we uh, rely so much on uh, the CAP aid. So we're very uncomfortable with that. And uh, for standards, it's very complicated uh, for those uh, um, raising poultry in free ranch, for example. It can be very complex in terms of standards. And there are also many inequalities in trade standards on imports. Obviously, realities may be different, but it's a source of a lot of problems for us. One last thing. In uh, France, uh, there's competition among trade unions, uh, so there will be professional elections in less than one year. It had an impact on uh, mobilization in some regions, in my region, for example. There are not so many challenges as in other region other regions. So I think that there's a whole set of problems requiring very strong structural responses uh, in France and everywhere else in Europe. It has been lasting for a very long time now. It needs to be addressed. Thank you very much, Mathieu. So we were talking about standards, European standards. Aurélie, I know that you worked a lot on the common agricultural policy. CAP and uh, European um, agricultural policies in general. Could you please um, share your analysis about France and within the European Union, more generally speaking? Are there specific uh, policies uh, that need uh, to be tackled? Uh, what about the point of view of IDRI? Hello, everyone. Thank you for inviting me. My name is Aurélie Catalo, and I work for a French think tank that is called the Institute of Sustainable Development and International Relations. Idri, so just to sum up all the challenges that were presented by uh, the different speakers coming from three member states, I think that we can say that um, the uh, European food system is facing many, many challenges that are common within the European Union. Obviously, there are different, very different farming structures from one member state to the other, but precisely with a common agricultural policy. We're trying to come up with uh, responses that are common yet adapted to the specific challenges of each member state. And yet um, putting uh, the uh, farmers uh, in a competition on, uh, on the market. So that leads to many tensions. Let's try to think of all the challenges uh, faced by French and European farmers. So there are three main categories. Economic challenges, first of all. Obviously, there's the issue of income, having an income that's uh, sufficient and stable throughout time, as Matcha said. There's uh, also the issue of healthy food, having enough food uh, to feed Europe or even countries outside of Europe. And still in the economic category, there's also a growing imbalance between supply and demand in terms of food on domestic markets. Then social challenges. There's the question of uh, the renewal of uh, farmers, uh, generations of farmers. And there's also the recognition of farmers, recognizing the dignity of uh, uh, being a farmer in our society today. And finally, there are environmental issues, environmental challenges. Uh, 
we talk a lot about uh, reducing uh, uh, CO2 emissions uh, uh, for farmers. That's one of the challenges, but that's not the only one. When we talk about uh, climate and agriculture, there's also carbon storing and soil adapting agriculture to climate change. And also, to some extent, we need to keep in mind the supply of biomass coming from agriculture to other sectors in uh, the econ in the economy so that they can uh, decarbonize their sector. There is also the preservation and restoration of biodiversity and natural resources, uh, especially water resources. So I just share with you a very long list of challenges and European farmers need to address all of them. What they see today is that the uh, f European uh, food system, as it is organized by the CAP, does not enable them to address these challenges. So I think there's a legitimate anger or discomfort in this profession. Now, what about the triggers? I gave you a list of challenges um, that um, was true in January but it was the case six months ago and it will be the case in six months. So in France, um, there was a lot of uh, rage boiling since the month of November. Uh, certain uh, local groups in uh, the major French trade unions started demonstrated in November. Um, they were saying that things were really upside down. It took a whole new level in January when our uh, German colleagues uh, did the same. I think that the uh, German situation uh, really uh, set fire to the uh, French situation beginning of 2024. What we heard is that uh, it might be because of the Green Deal if a French, uh, German, European farmers uh, decided to uh, to protest now. But in fact, there are two things that are contradictory. So it might be because of the Green Deal, uh, the European Union, that would go too far in terms of environmental regulation. But sometimes we also hear that it's because of uh, the uh, how the legislation is uh, translated in France, France going even too far compared to uh, EU regulation. So that's quite contradictory. When we have a lo look at the Green Deal and how the law is uh, uh, translated in France, it's not the key factor in farmers' uh, anger. The green, the, the farming part of the Green Deal does not translate into any additional obligation for European farmers. It was either postponed or um, largely diluted or not even uh, enforced right now. So it can't be because of that. And in terms of how the law has been translated in uh, uh, France, sure, it could be the case, but it has been the same in other European countries. So that's not consistent. At IDRI, we think that what we need is uh, uh, top-down harmonization at a European level uh, rather than less EU regulation. And let me now uh, wrap up. European farmers' um, demonstrations are very interesting uh, because we need to wonder about how we uh, led uh, the um, farming revolution so far. As you know, at a European level, uh, the debate is polarized. So there's the um, eco-friendly environmental movement saying we need to reach the environmental targets whatever it costs and without thinking about what the impact might be on uh, farming income. And then you have production oriented farmers uh, saying, I don't have any leeway financially speaking to change, so I don't care about the environment. So in order to go beyond that, we need to reassert that it they're not mutually exclusive. There's the ecological transition and farming income. And now the question that we need to ask ourselves is what are the conditions uh, that need uh, to be set up so that uh, farms uh, uh, can uh, survive and reach the environmental uh, goals. So no answer has been brought to the question right now when the European Commission uh, came up with the Green Deal. So we should not give up on these targets, but we need to question the method and how economic factors uh, are taken into account when we want to support the agroecological uh, transition. Thank you very much, Aurélie. Thank you for your comments. Uh, a lot of food for thought. 
So I think we can now uh, close this first part on the challenges faced by uh, European farmers in their countries, and we can now uh, move on to the second part of this webinar, which is really uh, what can we do to solve the crisis? So uh, what are the policies that should be set up locally and at our European level as well? leaders in different countries uh, point their fingers at environmental standards. In France, the government said that uh, they should stop uh, suspending the uh, Ecofito uh, plan. In Italy, uh, they're saying that they should they might work on the size of farms uh, in order to uh, bring profitability to farmers. So I wanted to know what you think of these solutions, solutions um, shared by governments or trade unions. So we'll start the second part with Gesine. She will speak in German. So this is uh, for interpreters. Uh, interpretation of from uh, French into German is actually on French. It's a, it's a technical glitch for those who would like to listen to German now. Please go back to main audio floor. Well, this is just for interpreters. You know what you're supposed to do. So I'll give the floor to Gizen on the uh, German situation. What type of intervention uh, you think should be necessary for Germany and uh, Europe as a whole? You have the floor. Five minutes, please. Okay, also ich habe jetzt ein bisschen mit meinem alten All right. So I think I understood what I had to do. Like there was a technical issue. I don't understand French. So do I have to change? the channels? No, no, you can just, you can just uh, answer the question. Did you understand the question? All right, so I will now talk about the, the German solutions or, or my interpretation of, of German solutions. Is that right? Okay, perfect. Well, we have heard all of these answers, all of these proposals uh, time and time again. There's nothing new, nothing radical. We just have uh, like this right wing extremists now taking to the streets. That's maybe new. But in general, I think that there are two different uh, paths that we can set out on and in order to change something for the daily lives of, inter of uh, farmers. I think first, Firstly, it would be important that green NGOs and NGOs uh, working around climate should really take these questions into account. Um, economy has to be put on, on the top list of priorities. I think that this framing was not done in the right way, especially in Germany during the past few years. And when uh, talking about uh, political measures, I think that subsidies need to be adapted as part of the new uh, common agricultural policy. Why? Well, because there are many, uh, many questions we still need to answer, especially around uh, big farms, around uh, large uh, um, land prices and and also we need to reinforce uh, the existing structures and uh, protect biodiversity um, when you look to different federal states there are already good uh, examples for example in saxony um, also around forestry that's something that we need to uh, focus on in the future in germany as well as in france but we need to have the expertise and we need to have long-term financial models for these projects. I think that uh, agricultural models need time to adapt. They need decades in order to adapt. So these, uh, sub, uh, these uh, um, subsidies need to be adapted in a long-term way. For example, now we have... Uh, we have the, the discussion of tax breaks on agricultural diesel in Germany. Um, that's a very short-term measure, I think. Uh, so 
we we really need to answer these questions if we want to ensure long-term supply of good quality food you really need to ensure that these structures are in place however we've seen during the past few years that on a european level we've had conservative policy leaders and now we have these liberals making decisions um, so of course there's a bit of a clash of ideas uh, but like i said i think the long-term effects uh, are most important i'm not sure if i can have the time to go into detail uh, please uh, yeah you have about five seven minutes for your answer okay that's that's all right so how, how many more minutes do you have left maybe two or three Okay, I can do it. And then, on the other hand, we also need to strengthen uh, the position of farms today. We really have a problem with land prices in Germany. These prices have doubled, tripled, quadrupled, especially in the eastern part of Germany. And this is very detrimental to um, the, the country in general. It's, it's uh, difficult for young people to get into farming, into agriculture, it, which then again makes it difficult to bring about changes in the system and uh, integrate new ideas. And then, as I said, it's an election years in uh, in Eastern Germany. Lots of mistakes have been made throughout the past 30 years, and we will now have to face the, the consequences. I think we need to try and keep big investors out of agricultural policy in Germany. That's something that we need to be aware of, and especially in the eastern part of Germany, as I said, but also in northern Germany. And it also affects farmers in the south of Germany because uh, these, uh, the competitiveness of small farms against these giants uh, is, of course, uh, under pressure. We have uh, a lot of pressure in, in our associations um, in all of these regards, but at least um, there are new law proposals in the the pipeline on a government level. I think this is why it's important that the civil society really rises up and, uh, and insists that we find answers to these questions. And then finally, I think that we need to um, really look into what's going on with retailers and large-scale processors, uh, Lidl, Aldi in Germany. These giants have uh, too much power. They have 95% market shares. They simply decide um, which prices they will they can set. So that's really something that we have to tackle. And it's also a reason for, for this uh, really intense frustration that farmers today have to have to face. So I think that the, the power between the state and big retailers really has to be rebalanced. There needs to be a shift. And we cannot forget about the, the position of farmers uh, who, who are then in the crossfire of, of, of uh, government and uh, large retailers. So like I said, we really need to strengthen the position of farmers in this system and also um, lift the the level of prices for agricultural products. I think this will bring about changes um, and, and this is something we have to do. Thank you, Gesine. I would like to give the floor to Panayotis now. So, same question. Uh, what about your Greek point of view on the crisis, potential solutions that you have in mind uh, within your cooperative to, to, to end the crisis? You have the floor. Uh, que ça fonctionne pour Panayotis? Panayotis, can you hear me? The sound is not very unfortunately. good. Oui. Oh. Unfortunately, the, the connection is really bad. Est-ce que c'est bon maintenant? Okay, so Panayotis, is it working now? Okay. Uh, donc, je vais repose la question. Um, Let super. me ask the question again. Great, seems to be working. So, giving you the floor now, would like to hear your uh, point of view in Greece and the situation um, 
tell us about the potential solutions uh, that you have in mind uh, at your cooperative. Αυτό είναι ότι ο Ευρωπαϊκός είναι μέσα με πάρα πολλές προκλήσεις, τις οποίες και σε αυτές... I think that I can say that we are faced with uh, lots of different challenges in Greece. So instead of talking about uh, the Green Deal, we should rather discuss uh, what is important to farmers so that we can uh, actually continue to count on farmers and their work and and important participation in society i think that there are a number of crises uh, that we will need to confront in, in the upcoming years when i take a look at the situation in my region i see that the climate uh, the climate change phenomena already play an important role. That's something we haven't even mentioned so far. In my region, we have seen a uh, catastrophe of flooding, 300 cubic meters of soil per minute were flooded. And there is an issue with the sound again. The connection is bad. So when we hear talk about climate change, uh, the, this crisis of climate change, then this is not something that will uh, be a problem in the future. No, it is already a problem right now. It is something that will continue to shape our everyday lives, especially the everyday lives of farmers. Farmers need to... Uh, ensure that they are well prepared to tackle these uh, challenges and they can only be well prepared if they receive the sufficient financial means and support. Farmers need to invest today so they can uh, ensure a production of, uh, um, of safer crops, of uh, future-proof um, crops and at the same time the government needs to also play a more active role in setting the prices for agricultural products. And at this point, I would like to add something else, another challenge that we face, a challenge that we will need to better prepare for. And this concerns farmers throughout Europe. And I am talking here about unfair competition. There are unfair trading practices outside of Europe that uh, also concern EU countries, because we know that in third countries, there are no real checks on qualities, on contents of agricultural problems, uh, agricultural products. These checks uh, are not um, are not happening often enough and not concerning all deliveries. And it means that there are agricultural products reaching European markets that are not um, meeting the standards that we, European farmers and producers, need to meet. I think this is a real problem for competition today. It is simply an unfair trading practice. This is why bilateral trade agreements between uh, the EU and third countries need to be revised, especially with those countries that have unfair trading practices or have production standards that do not meet our own. We have to ensure that this competition um, is rebalanced. Looking at uh, our own production, we also have to talk about the role that organic farms and organic farmers play. We see that these farms and production sites um, have a lower production rate than conventional farms. And that means that uh, the quality is usually better, but um, quantitatively, these organic farms are, of course, far below uh, the standards set for conventional farms. And finally, I would like to add that we need to to talk uh, more about the common agricultural policy. Through this instrument, we can take into account 
the differences between agricultural regions, uh, between uh, agricultural climates. It is something that we have to take into account on a European level. I think it should help us focus on the different problems farmers have to face uh, in different regions, because Greek farmers have issues that may differ from those that German farmers face. I think that policies on a European level need to ensure that these differences are visible and that we are all aware of them. In addition to better information, this would also help us prepare for competition throughout Europe. I think that there is a proposal to further strengthen strengthen these regional differences. And this is something that I am very pleased to see. But we really need to look into these uh, different regional problems and the, find the most, uh, um, the most adapted solutions. Thank you very much, Panayotis, for your um, very comprehensive comments. Now let's move on to Aurélie to hear her analysis of the French situation and the uh, potential solutions that you developed at IDRI. And of course, you can also uh, talk about European policies if you want. Sure, thank you. So, I would like to talk about the announcements made by the French government in order to ease uh, the anger of uh, French farmers. They announced many, many things, lots of concessions. So I think it's uh, quite relevant to try and categorize uh, the different types of announcements that were made. Um, then we can analyze what kind of announcement is really um, to get out of the crisis or something that's more political on the long term to improve the situation for farmers. So. The Prime Minister made announcements to um, for French farmers. Uh, there were a couple of announcements, but not so many on income. It was mostly um, additional state money that was paid uh, faster to farmers uh, just to respond to the crisis. In terms of income, he also talked about uh, the value distribution throughout the whole value chain. So agri-food business and uh, large retailers should be better controlled uh, to make sure that the um, most damageable practices should be avoided for farmers. But those are the two solutions um, that he came up with for income. Otherwise, it was not really a topic that he focused on. There were many political announcements that were promises to streamline the uh, red tape administrative burden for farmers uh, or even uh, the other types of burdens. So simplification of the um, legal system when there are uh, complaints in terms of water storage or how um, some um, breeding farms uh, should be uh, increased in size. There were also other announcements on things that are very um, French specific or European level uh, rules in terms of uh, CAP conditionality. As you know, the European Commission under the pressure of France decided to um, give up on one rule of uh, the uh, cap, which is uh, a share of uh, non-productive uh, uh, arable land. And there was also an announcement of a productivity to, on sovereignty to improve the uh, sovereignty of French agriculture to meet uh, French needs. However, such announcements are quite surprising because when you talk about French sovereignty, what it shows is that we are not really sovereign. So that's a good opportunity to put forward uh, the, the real weaknesses of French uh, agriculture. And finally, among the French announcements, there were commitments made by France to address uh, topics at a European level, uh, for example, for international trade, um, the uh, Mercosur Agreement, and the introduction of so-called mirror clauses in free trade agreements. 
generally speaking. So those are the main categories of uh, solutions uh, that were shared by the French government. What we can see is that some answers uh, really answer um, the main points that had been um, shared by uh, French trade unions, but there's no structural answer to address uh, the challenges that I mentioned before. And farmers put a lot of pressure on the government to have uh, quick, concrete solutions. But it's not in three weeks that you can put an end to a crisis that has been lasting for 10 years now. At IDRI, uh, what we think we need is we should organize a public debate on uh, our agricultural model and the vision that we have of agriculture at our European level and uh, in France. Uh, a bit before, I said that we're facing a major problem because we cannot connect the physical dimension and the ecological uh, dimension of farming. In France, uh, when we work on our strategy to uh, lower CO2 emissions for farming, nothing is said about the impact on production volumes or farmers' yield. The only thing that is said is that if we do it, we will be able to reduce the CO2 emissions by a certain number. And we don't tell farmers, in this case, it means you will produce less wheat, but uh, there will be um, other crops that will grow you'll have to change your whole production system in this way or another way. And it's a gridlock. That's why environmental policies do not work. So beyond the quick answers um, to stop the crisis, to meet a farmer's uh, need, uh, we need to take a step back, take the time to gather all agricultural stakeholders in Europe, in France, to agree on the economic impact of environmental efforts that we are asking farmers to do. And at the same time, we need to define the economic support measures that a society is ready to do so that farmers can uh, do this transition successfully. Thank you, that's perfect, Aurélie. Thank you, and we will uh, wrap up this so webinar with Mathieu before moving on to the uh, Q&A session. Mathieu from the Collectif Nourrir. Uh, so let's talk about how we can end the crisis uh, from your point of view, from the point of view of your uh, collective. And then uh, we'll take some questions. Uh, four questions, you can ask some more questions if you wish. Mathieu, you have the floor. Well, just to echo what Aurélie just said, I think that um, everybody was so much involved in so many European countries, which means there's a democratic problem. That's very clear. There are large scale demonstrations everywhere. So there's a democratic issue. It's at the heart of the crisis and at the heart of its resolution as well. At a national or European level, we need to take time to think of our food and uh, farming democracy and try to connect the two a bit more than what we're doing at the moment. That's a, that's a real challenge. Then going back to some measures, farming income is at the heart. So the price of uh, farming products, it's really at the heart of everything. There needs to be European answers, a continuous deregulation of uh, trade, as was done by the European Union. So they need to put an end to that and um, be in control of it, of prices. That's something that needs to be done at a European level. There's also the continuation of uh, trade deals. Uh, they are said to be more and more progressive, but I think it's a, it's a real question. You know, should we uh, send food all around the planet? That's a real question. There's also the issue of speculation on farming markets. Just to give you an example, the 10 largest financial groups made more than 2 billion euros in profit in the uh, first half of 2022. So there are people who really um, can profit, can benefit from the crisis, the crisis in Ukraine. So there's money made 
in the uh, agri-food business, in the farming world. So the challenge is that of the distribution of income. The second point revolves around the distribution of production sectors. So there's the there are growing inequalities between farmers. It's a reality. And we cannot build a future for farmers if we do not talk about production factors. So land, how can we distribute land? Access to water, obviously it's discussed everywhere across Europe. Access to subsidies, uh, CAP subsidies, 80% of CAP uh, um, subsidies go to 20% of farmers in France. We cannot succeed in transitions if uh, things are not done in a fair manner. So distribution should really be at the heart of the next European policies. Third point, how to support people in this transition. I can see my colleagues who are making so many efforts uh, for the environment and then to see the announcements made by the, the French government and uh, the Green Deal, so they're, they're thinking we make so much effort, uh, we're not paid by uh, the CAP, we do not get anything uh, for it. So I think there are so many farmers who are doing so many great things uh, for the environment to relocate food. We need to support them in the next months and years. Obviously, it means that there should be a reform of the CAP we need to lower reliability on um, pesticides, uh, fertilizers, uh, equipment and machinery. We need to have um, different systems uh, for cows, for grazing. But all of these things are not supported by uh, the CAP, which is the uh, largest uh, finance uh, financer for uh, for farmers at a European level. There's the problem of uh, the renewal of generations, as I said before, and there's also the issue of food. In France, there are between three and five million of people who have uh, access to um, food aid. So there are, there's a share of farmers who um, cannot make a living and uh, consumers who cannot afford the products either. So, so many inequalities, and that's the real debate. If we want to upgrade our products, we need consumers uh, to buy them, which means we need to um, address inequalities in society to be able to upgrade uh, the products uh, also from a consumer's point of view. That's what I wanted to share with you. Thank you so much to all of you, all four of you, for your comments um, that were so fascinating on the uh, structural, conjectural causes of uh, the crisis in Europe and the potential solutions that should be envisaged. Let's move uh, to the questions now. We have uh, 10 of them. I don't think we'll be able to answer all of them, but I'll give the floor to Benjamin, who will present the questions in two parts, I think, and then you guys just take the floor whenever you want it's up to you. So let's take 10 minutes for the questions and then we'll wrap up. Okay, so there are questions that are addressed to some speakers. First one comes from Greece, a question for Mathieu. So Mathieu, you referred to a declining farming income. Do you include income transfers uh, from the CAP? So in other words, uh, is it the farm income that matters or the household income? Uh, there was a question on Gesine, uh, on Germany. Is there the uh, same problem as in France? Um, farmers getting um, uh, very poor under the um, poverty threshold and uh, leaving their farms, it hasn't been mentioned. And finally, question on the European strategic um, at the EU. Um, could it be the public debate that Idri wants? So the first question was from Mathieu, if I'm not mistaken. Mathieu, go ahead. Okay, thanks. Yes, I was talking about farming income, obviously. I was uh, talking about uh, CAP subsidies. 
In France, it's a bit less at the European level, but in France, I think it's 80% of farming income coming from uh, CAP uh, subsidies. Uh, it varies, though, from one production sector to another. Mm. Let's take um, vegetables or uh, trees, so you need a smaller uh, surface areas. They don't get a lot of subsidies from CAP uh, because CAP is based on the uh, size of the farm. So for the sectors that I mentioned, they don't get a lot of subsidies. Uh, in France, we import half of the fruits and vegetables uh, that we eat. So if we want to ensure uh, food sovereignty or self-sufficiency in such sectors, uh, we'll need to produce more. And uh, we need to better channel the uh, CAP subsidies. Um, that, that could be a solution. And on the other side, we have uh, large sized uh, farms that get a lot of subsidies from CAP. So the distribution method is uh, not the right one. And then I talked about inequalities that exist depending on production sectors in uh, France. Uh, breeding, uh, cattle breeding is uh, a sector that is uh, that has been shrinking, but for uh, pig breeding or grains, uh, farmers um, make more money in such sectors. So farming income, it's very hard to calculate it. But there are many figures that are interesting. I said that 18% of farmers are under the poverty threshold, uh, including uh, non-farming income. So that's the situation. But income farming, how to calculate it, uh, farming income, it's much more complicated. It's quite low. And uh, there are many inequalities. And I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Second question was for Gizina. Gizina, I hope you were able to hear the question. Let me repeat it. Is there the same phenomenon in Germany as in France, uh, um, farmers getting poorer and poorer? Well, I think it's important to point out that there are great differences. When we talk about agriculture, there's not one phenomenon. We can talk about one situation. That's an, a mistake that politicians and decision makers often make. Um, agricultural production sites and farms are very diverse. There are regional differences. There are enormous differences between different types of agriculture, also between uh, farms with livestock. And then there's the question of what actually counts as a farm, because there are many big farms in uh, eastern parts of Germany that are now uh, bought up by big investors. So for me, it's difficult to say whether that's the truth in, in Germany or not. But I would say that in the last 25 years, we see that the uh, number of farms in Germany has been cut in half. So there are different reasons for this. Um, small family farms have, um, well, have sometimes been abandoned, have stopped producing, but some of those still exist. We have farmers with 2,500 hectares, 6,000 hectares, or 10 to 12,000 hectares, uh, which are then brought together as part of one um, production site or agricultural uh, uh, super farm. So there are these different phenomenons. We see that 14% of the biggest uh, farms in Germany uh, working on two thirds of, uh, uh, of soils in Germany. So we have these big structures. So um, that's something we have to take into account. We have uh, farmers or well, um, investors, uh, industrial uh, stakeholders who uh, really uh, make big money in agriculture. However, if I'm a small farmer with a small farm, the, the situation is very different. I might maybe only make 500 euros a month, which is a catastrophe. So we see that it is uh, very difficult to survive as a small farmer or, or even get started with a small farm uh, since land prices are incredibly high. So really, you, you have to take into account this situation. 
In general, we can say that in Germany, small farms are, of course, suffering and also working below the poverty line. However, you always need to ask the question of what you actually um, look at when you look at farms and, and impoverished farms, etc. We can say that uh, lots of farmers also have to deal with a lot of debt. People who want to start farming um, need to invest 650,000 euros to just uh, get started. I mean, this is an absolute disaster, so it's impossible to actually get into agriculture. We also see that farms with uh, livestock have um, em enormous problems with uh, their level of debt. They still have to pay off debt of the original investment that they made in their livestock. So we, I think we really should think about um, public programs in order to reduce these uh, levels of debt that make it deleveraging possible for these um, farms, especially if you uh, make conditions uh, for these deleveraging programs um, around uh, organic farming and animal well-being. But we really need a political will to make this happen. And we also need to have uh, pilot projects that, that really you look at whether whether this is viable in germany i think we need to also look at the supply chains because if we want to change the system we also need to adapt supply chains and uh, this area is also very critical in germany we have uh, a problem with a lack of skills in in many um, throughout many jobs along the agri food business and value chain this is something we see in Germany time and again. We have uh, we have now a political will to actually actually change these uh, structures, these supply chains. I think uh, the situation in France uh, is uh, maybe less dramatic than in Germany. That, uh, but yeah, this is the situation. I would say. Thank you. There was a question for Idri. Yes, question uh, from Greece. So at the moment, the European Commission announced a postponement of the reduction of pesticides, uh, which reduces part of the transition cost for farmers, makes uh, the big agrochemical companies happy. Do you have any suggestions to get out of this uh, catch-22? And another question on the increase of uh, fuel prices, uh, that it's still um, going on and it's been a while. Uh, what about uh, alternative uh, fuels in the next few years? Uh, how can we uh, phase out uh, fossil fuels? Um, let me start. I would like to answer the question uh, addressed to Idri on um, the public debate that we need. The strategic dialogue that was launched a few weeks ago by the president of the European Commission is, uh, uh, we think, a very relevant um, format for dialogue. I cannot say if this strategic dialogue will lead to the results that we want at IDRI. But in any case, uh, the format is quite promising because there's confidentiality and it's possible to have a very close look at the diagnosis of uh, uh, farming today. When you talk about public debate, you think of a very large a citizen convention with 400 people. At IDRI, we do not think that we could have such a large circle at the beginning because, and that's absolutely key at, to this day, there's no compromise on um, what we should wish for uh, farmers uh, today. And that's the first thing that we should address. Let me give you an example. In France, we produce a lot of wheat. And at the same time, we're told that we need to produce more plant-based proteins, more beans. So people say, okay, that's great. Let's keep uh, producing uh, wheat. And others say, well, um, let's uh, produce more um, legumes. Uh, but the thing is that we cannot extend um, arable land in France. If we have uh, more leguminous plants, it will be at the expense of other crops, wheat, for example. 
And today there is no dialogue between uh, these sectors and there's no consensus to say, okay, we agree to produce more legumes, even though it might uh, shrink um, land available for wheat and uh, hence our export uh, capacities. So we think it's absolutely key to uh, initiate such dialogue to have a consensus within the farming profession and then with a bigger circle. So then it would be interesting to uh, involve citizens and have something that's a bit more participatory in nature. But there is a complete lack of shared vision in farming sectors on the uh, concrete physical transformations necessary for the agroecological transition. Thank you very much. Thank you, Aurélie. Um, so there were other questions. Uh, Panagiotis, would you like to add something? Would you like to answer some of these questions? Let's uh, wait for the translations uh, to reach other uh, speakers and uh, we'll end uh, with a comment by Panayotis to answer the questions that have been asked and then we'll wrap up the webinar. Δεν ακούγει το ήχος. So I didn't get uh, the translation of what Panayotis just said, so I cannot answer him. Panayotis, would you like to answer one of the questions that were asked? I hope that interpreting still works. Panayotis, did you did you hear me? Did you understand? Να επαναλάβω ότι θα πρέπει στη νέα κατάσταση όπως έχει διαμορφωθεί και μετά από τον... ότι φαίνεται το πρόβλημα να δεικνύεται το ευρωπαϊκό πρόβλημα που υπάρχει στον τομέα των αγωτικών θα πρέπει να δούμε με μεγαλύτερη επιστασία το κομμάτι το πώς θα οργανώσουμε την, την παραγωγή καλύτερα πάνω στην, ε, στην πράσινη ανάπτυξη, πάνω στην βιώσιμη ανάπτυξη έχοντας όμως στο επίκεντρο τον παραγωγό και όχι να ξεκινάμε από τις Βρυξέλλες και να καταλήγουμε στον παραγωγό ανάποδα. Θα πρέπει να ξεκινήσουμε να δούμε πώς θα μπορέσει να διαμορφωθεί αυτή η κατάσταση έτσι ώστε η παραγωγή να είναι βιώσιμη, να είναι οικονομικά βιώσιμη και να μπορέσουν να αντιμετωπίσουν όλες τις προκλήσεις τις οποίες αναπέφτουν και δεν θέλω να επαναλάβω αυτές οι οποίες Ok, je crois qu'il n'y a malheureusement pas eu de traduction dans aucune des langues. Uh, on est vraiment désolé pour ce. I think there was no translation in none of the languages. We're very sorry. Um... So the uh, Greek interpreter said that they translated. Maybe there was a microphone problem for this last question. Well, I hope that everybody was able to listen to the rest of the webinar in their own language. Uh, I would like to thank all of you, all of our speakers uh, for your uh, brilliant comments. It was so interesting. Thank you to all of you for and taking the time to uh, share uh, your point of view with us. It was nice to have this uh, analysis uh, coming from uh, different European countries. Thank you to all our participants.
who attended uh, the webinar. I hope you enjoyed it. The webinar was uh, recorded in all the languages, so you'll have uh, access to it later. And um, goodbye, everyone, and bon appétit. Enjoy your lunch if you're about to have lunch in your country. Thank you, everyone. See you soon. Au revoir.